All right, let's get started. Uh, Len is out this week. He's in Hawaii. The poor guy. Um, he promised us he'd be up at four o'clock watching this. In Hawaii. I told him to have a report on all our desks uh, next week about it. Um, the word of the week for people on the outside is boo, B-O-O. So it's a uh, Halloween theme. So we're privileged to have uh, Dr. Ron Simon here from Scripps. He's the head uh, Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Scripps and an adjunct member, Department of Experimental and Molecular Medicine at Scripps Research Institute. He did his med school at University of Chicago, his residency at uh, Northwestern, and his postgrad training at, at Scripps. And he's published in various journals, as you all know, including Jackie and the Annals. Um, He's here today to discuss the diagnosis and management of one of the great medical masqueraders, laryngeopharyngeal reflux, or LPR. Um, and I would particularly like to thank him for braving the elements that he, since he said it was 80 degrees and sunny when he left uh, San Diego a couple days ago. So I appreciate him for coming out. Yeah, thanks, Drew. I, I always enjoy coming up here to, to do this. Actually, it's nice to see a change in weather every once in a while. It gets so boring in San Diego. <laughs> I'd love to be bored. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Lynn and I were talking about what, what of my multiple people talks to give, and, and this is one of my favorites, and I had just prepared it for our own group, for the Scripps group, so it was nice to be able to use the same talk twice. Uh, so I'll just basically get right to it. Um, so there's really no disclosures for this. I'm hardly going to mention many, too many medications. Uh, but I am on the Speakers Bureau for a number of different companies, but they're not particularly, not at all relevant to this talk. Um, I think we'll skip the objectives. Now, when I give my talks to the clinic, uh, I always like to put in some cartoons or some something to make a little humorous segues. I've, obviously, over the years I've been there, I've given so many talks, I've run out of things to put in. So I, I, I've done puns, I've done just all sorts of things. And I just keep running out of things. So this year, I found something called paraprodokians. So those are figures of speech in which the latter part of the sentence or the phrase is surprising or un unexpected, and is frequently used in a humorous situation. So where there's a will, there's a where there's a will, I want to be in it, is a paraprodokian. <laughs> All right. So first, let's talk about terminology. Um, everybody, you know, these days knows what GERD is. You know, there's so many direct-to-consumer advertising that GERD is pretty much part of the lexicon, even though people may not know what it, what it really stands for. But that's a disease that's really marked by heartburn and then sometimes a feeling of regurgitation. LPR, or laryngopharyngeal reflux, is something that's used by ENTs. They've kind of coined that term. And one of the fellows I've been working with not so much came up with, but found nasopharyngeal reflux, which I think for allergists is probably maybe the most relevant term. Uh, the ENT see it because patients come in complaining of hoarseness, but we see it because patients come in complaining <laughs> about post-nasal drainage. So I think any of those terms are okay, but I sort of tried to coin my own term. You know, for years, uh, people were using the terms aspirin-induced asthma, aspirin-sensitive asthma, and we always didn't really like those terminologies. We tried to change it to AERD, and I think it's pretty much been established. Now my mission is to get this condition renamed. Anyway, it has even many other synonyms including a typical reflux, extraesophageal reflux, uh, silent reflux. I don't know if anybody was watching TV a few weeks ago, but Dr. Oz did a whole entire segment on silent reflux. So it has many, many different names. I think you know any condition that has so many names, it's just a great mystery. It's a, it really means it's a great masquerader. So this condition really has respiratory complications. It can be present in patients with GERD, but the reason why it's sometimes called silent reflux, or to me is a, is a mystery, is when it's present without GERD. Because I think even as a primary care physician, if somebody comes in to see you and they have heartburn and they complain of a cough, you'll probably make that association. But if they don't have heartburn and they just come in complaining about cough, post-nasal drainage, intermittent hoarseness, throat clearing, any of those things, you don't necessarily tie it to reflux because they don't have typical GERD heartburn. Uh, the ENTs also see it a lot because these are patients who think there's something stuck in their throat. Um, and then this post-nasal drip thing. The post-nasal drip is very, very distinctive. We're used to seeing patients that have post-nasal drip from allergic rhinitis, from sinusitis, and those patients can give you the long-winded, incredible description of the amount of drainage, the color of the drainage, the consistency of the drainage. They'll, they'll wax poetic for the longest time trying to describe their drainage. And they have lots of other symptoms where these patients come in complaining about years, decades, sometimes even lifelong post-nasal drip, 
And I'll say to them, what does it look like? And they'll say, I don't know, I, I never see it. But yet 24 seven, I mean, every waking moment, even when they're asleep, they're throat clearing, they're complaining something's stuck there, they're complaining about post nasal drip, and yet they've never seen it. So that I think is almost pathognomonic. It's really a diagnostic point when somebody comes in and says, I've got post nasal drip, and you ask them, what does it look like? If they don't know, they've got LPR. If they can explain it, then they probably have something else. So I don't think that there really is drainage. I think that either their brain or some other physician's brain has said, well, <clears throat> why are you always <clears throat> throat clearing? And they'll say, well, it's something that I feel something there. And I'm going, well, what does it feel like? And somehow they come up with this drip and then they connect with their physicians. So then forever after, they just talk about their post-nasal drip, but actually they, they really don't have it. Uh, you can get other things that are on this list, you know, dysphonia. It's interesting that it only occasionally actually produces pain. So where GERD is heartburn, so when acid hits the lower esophagus, it clearly leads to a burning irritation. For whatever reason, the same acid up in the back of the throat hardly ever burns, but it clearly is irritating to the back of the throat because, again, the brain perceives it as something being there, something <clears throat> that they need to clear their throat about. Now, what's also interesting to me is, as you look through the literature, there are people who are beginning to think that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, not in all cases, but in some cases, may be actually due to microaspirations of either stomach acid or other stomach contents in patients with LPR. Because if you think about it, if the acid or the stomach contents can get up to the top of the esophagus, to the oropharynx, all it has to do is turn the corner, especially if it's happening when the patient is supine, and then go into the lungs. And obviously, if you get laryngitis, it has to be affecting the vocal cords, so some of it can get past the vocal cords into the lungs. Then to see it as eroding the backs of teeth and uh, again, over the years, we've definitely seen people who we get consults for penicillin allergy in the hospital and are patients that have had, had pneumonia and they're having aspiration pneumonia. And I think that some of that is also from stomach acid or the stomach contents getting into the lungs. It's like, again, a chemical pneumonitis. And again, there's some reports now coming out linking LPR to bronchiectasis, which again makes sense if the acid or other stomach contents can get down there. So this is very common and I think also potentially quite serious. So getting back to the definition of terms, I've tried to coin the term SERD or supraesophageal reflux disease for a couple of reasons. Again, GERD has become part of the lexicon. So when you mention to somebody GERD, it clicks. So SERD is not a terribly distant extension to that, where if you have to completely change terminology and talk about LPR or NPR, it doesn't really resonate as much to me. But also, you know, whether you're ENT seeing laryngitis and globus, you're an allergist seeing post-nasal drip and congestion, whether it's asthma, whether it's lower respiratory, it's everything that's above the level of the esophagus. It's all complications from that reflux. So I like the term superesophageal reflux disease or, or SERD. Not that I'm having a lot of progress yet, but um, I'm working on it. It took us a while to get AERD there. So again, if you want to compare and contrast the two conditions, GERD is all heartburn. SERD may be in some patients, but it's not really classic. The respiratory symptoms are all in SERD. So you don't see esophagitis, and that's really important because most patients wind up, if somebody's even thinking about LPR, getting referred to GI to have either an endoscopy or a pH monitoring, and they're told that you don't have GERD, so therefore you don't have LPR. Uh, so you don't see esophagitis. In SERD, obviously, you see laryngeal inf inflammation. The pH monitoring gets very interesting because esophageal pH monitoring, you pick up GERD, um, but not so much with SERD. As you get up into the pharynx, you start to pick up more SERD, but even that is pretty low. Uh, pharyngeal pH monitoring is a little bit above, you'll, you'll see a picture of it in a minute, a little bit above the upper esophageal sphincter, but it really isn't in the, the oropharynx. So it's been shown to be a better tool than esophageal monitoring, but not really all that good. So here's what's interesting. Um, Every paper you read, everything that's written about GERD is that it's supine, which makes sense, but that SERD is upright reflux. And we have data that completely contradicts that. So this has been the classic thing. What's different is that people with SERD do have upright reflux, where GERD patients don't usually, unless they're eating and, and then they have a distended stomach and they're sort of sitting. Uh, but pure sort of fasting upright reflux is really classic for SERD. Uh, but it's not the most common. The most common is still supine. So here's what I think is going on. Now, I'll hopefully go over this more than once because it's a little bit complicated. We did this last night, so for anybody who was there, they're hearing this for the second time. In, in, in my opinion, in pure GERD, 
you have an incompetent lower esophageal sphincter, but your upper esophageal sphincter is perfectly competent. If somebody only has SIRD, they have a competent lower esophageal sphincter, but an incompetent upper esophageal sphincter. And if you have both, then you've got two incompetent sphincters. And that's how I think the diseases sort of stack up. How can you get acid in the pharynx without having acid in the esophagus? Yeah, so that's the thing. So I was going to get to that. The timing of the question is perfect. When you talk about a competent lower esophageal sphincter, that doesn't mean it's a perfect sphincter. Okay, so we normally think, say, of our anal sphincter as being perfectly competent, but the lower esophageal sphincter is not perfect, it's just competent. So if you order a 24-hour pH monitor, esophageal 24-hour pH monitor on a patient, if you've ever seen the report, the report doesn't say, yes, there was acid positive, no, there was no acid negative. It says that the amount of acid seen over the 24 hours exceeded the normal limit or didn't. So that tells me that in the normal individual, there is some esophageal acid. So it's a, so that, so the definition of a competent lower esophageal sphincter is not a perfect sphincter. Does that make sense? Yeah, but still you have low acid. No, wait, wait. So, so, so if, if that, no, makes, that makes sense. Okay, but... okay so, so to get GERD, <clears throat> you have to exceed a limit. And then when you exceed that limit, you get heartburn. But there's still some acid in the normal individual. So if you combine that normal amount of acid that escapes the competent lower esophageal sphincter with an incompetent upper esophageal sphincter, that's how it gets up there. But if you have somebody with a perfectly, but the upper esophageal sphincter is supposed to be perfectly competent. So that little bit of acid is not supposed to get up to the throat. I'll show you a picture of a normal <coughs> oropharyngeal pH monitor. And it's rock solid, seven across the board for the whole 24 hours. That's normal. So any acid in the oropharynx is abnormal. That makes sense now? Yeah, but you still should have only acid coming from the stomach, so you should be able to pick it up at the lower sphincter <laughs> with the monitor. You sh I'm just trying to figure out how you can have acid at the upper sphincter without having seen it at the lower sphincter. You see it, but it's normal. Now, I understand what you're saying, but then you're saying <laughs> it becomes abnormal up higher, and this is where we get into it with our ENT physicians, and they put these probes in everybody, and then they say, they have a totally normal Bravo probe for 24 hours. It's useless. It's totally useless. Okay. It's useless. <clears throat> it's useless because when they say totally normal, they don't mean that there's no acid. No, I, I got that point. <clears throat> so, so that's the acid that's coming up here. It's just that normal acid that's, that can get up there because the upper esophageal sphincter is incompetent. Okay. Um, so typically... To treat GERD, it's sort of easy. You know, you can take an over-the-counter H2 receptor antagonist. Certainly, if you do PPIs, it's unbelievably effective. If you double dose the PPI to GERD, I mean, you're basically home free for most patients. Not quite the same <clears throat> for these patients. And again, even though classically it's said that twice daily PPIs treats this condition, it really doesn't. That treats the acid reflux. But remember, if acid gets out of the stomach, anything else can get out of the stomach and work its way up into the back of the throat. So that includes partially digested food. What I tell people is, who's ever having a glass of orange juice this morning, or if you're having a, a diet Pepsi, if that comes up into the back of your throat, that's gonna be just as acidic as the stomach acid is, and no dose of PPI is gonna do anything at all about that. So anything has free reign coming up into the back of the throat. It actually gets even more complicated than that because there are other things that we'll, we'll talk about. So there are some studies that have suggested that in patients without classic GERD symptoms, Maybe 40 to 60% of asthmatics have LPR. <clears throat> the people who go to the ENT physicians, again, complaining about globus and, and uh, coughing and laryngitis, very, very high. And in you know, cough centers, when they see people, because they talk about post-nasal drip as being the most common cause of cough in chronic cough clinics, most of that is not allergy. Most of that is really LPR. So there's one theory you know, that pathophysiology is the reflux theory. We've been really talking about that. But again, acid can come up, partially digested food can come up, but pepsin can come up. <clears throat> pepsin is just as irritating as stomach acid, but it's much more diabolical. On this Dr. Oz show, they had the most incredible visual graphic about, about pepsin. Uh, so pepsin is, a, is an enzyme. It's very, very irritating wherever it happens to touch, like the back of the throat. But it's also deactivated in an alkaline environment but then reactivated in an acid environment. So the same pepsin can be sitting up in the back of the throat, latched on there, 
And even if you are treating with PPIs, even if you're following a good diet, even doing any of that, if you do happen to drink something acidic, you will reactivate the pepsin and it'll start to irritate the back of the throat again. So in reality, um, because again, of non-acidic stomach content, non-stomach acid contents refluxing up and pepsin stick, stuck to the back of the throat, even acid suppression with double dose PPIs is gonna be an incomplete treatment. There are studies that have even shown that bile acid, even some pancreatic enzymes can find their way all the way up into the back of the throat. Uh, again, it's not surprising that's gonna to lead to irritation of the entire upper airway, and again, very easily turning the corner, going into the lungs, producing the other conditions we talked about. And then there are people who think that it's really just a reflex theory, that the acid gets up into the esophagus, maybe back of the throat, and then the brain senses that irritation and sends down all this drainage and starts you coughing and doing that as kind of a protective response. And I don't know that this necessarily has to be one way or the other. I think there's probably combinations of the two. Light travels faster than sound. That's why some people appear bright until you hear them speak. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how do you diagnose the condition? Well, you can look for a symptom questionnaire. Um, that's really good. There's something that's called the, let's see if I get there next, yeah, the Bolapsky score or the reflux symptom index, the RSI. And if you look at the uh, different criteria, they're all the things we've been talking about. If you have a hoarse voice, are you clearing your throat, do you have excess anger? And you can get anywhere from zero to a five, depending upon how severe it is. Um, and it turns out that a RSI of over 11 is very highly suspicious of having LPR. And, and you can get this, this uh, thing and print it up and give it to patients if you want. And to get 11, it's really not all that easy. I mean, a couple of fives and you're almost there, but the patient would have to consider that a really severe problem. So you've got this uh, reflux symptom index. What about doing a barium swallow? For, well, from everything I've said, it should be pretty clear that this is not gonna be good for CERD uh, because it's not even very good for GERD. All you're really seeing is a hale hernia, and maybe if they really press on the stomach hard, you'll, you'll demonstrate a little bit of, of reflux coming up into the lower esophagus. It's got very little to do with LPR. So what about looking at the larynx? You're saying how the ENT colleagues are sending all these patients thinking they have reflux and putting things down and looking around. Well, yes, if you do rhinopharyngoscopy, you may see inflammation, but how do you know what that inflammation is from? Is it LPR? Is it truly postnasal drainage from allergic rhinitis or sinusitis? It could be either, neither, or both. And despite the fact that the most common thing that the ENTs see is what they call either erythema or edema or both of this area here uh, called the arytenoids. It turns out to be a completely nonspecific finding. So if you're actually doing nasal pharyngoscopy, it's this area here, and if it looks like maybe a little bit red here on the edge, a little bit more swollen than normal, that's supposed to be, according to many ENTs, a pathognomonic sign of LPR. Well, the problem is they all think that, but there are several studies that have shown that it's really not very useful, that there's tremendous inter-observer variability. So they took 250 videos in this study, and they had patients who were perfectly normal and patients who clearly had LPR, and when they looked for ENTs to say, you know, who is who, there was just tremendous inter-observer variability. So when it's blinded and you don't know who it is, it's different. When, they, when they're seeing people in the practice, that's a high-risk group because they're being referred for coughing, they're being referred for laryngitis, being referred for postnasal drip. So it's a high-risk group. Chances are they probably do have it, but when you actually do it in a blinded fashion, it's not really accurate at all. So it turns out that there are these three studies that have shown that not only is it not diagnostic of LPR, it's really hardly even suggestive when people are blinded. Now, I've presented these studies to our ENTs, and the response I get is, is consistent. Well, those are the studies, but I can tell. Yes, I don't, I don't know really what to do about that, but, I, but I'm sort of glad because they don't really treat LPR. They wind up either referring them to GI and they don't really know how to treat it either, but now that they know that I'm interested in it, they send it to me, so I, I don't really mind them finding all these people who they think have it because I do pH monitoring anyway and really prove whether they have it or not and then really know how to effectively manage them. But again, don't let the ENT people sort of sway you by thinking they can figure it out. Because it turns out that just like there was an RSI score for a history of, of CERD, there's actually a reflux symptom, a reflux finding score for the ENTs. And here, you, if you get a score that's over seven, it's highly predictive for LPR. But if you look at edema 
of the retinoids it is erythema of the retinoids is only gets you two, and edema gets you another two, so you're only at four out of seven. So very clearly, that's just not sufficient for diagnosing LPR. So what about a therapeutic trial of, of acid suppression? Well, that's really you know, all you can do. So again, H2 receptor blockers work great for GERD, but they don't generally work for SIRD. Proton pump inhibitors, again, the literature suggests that they work very well, although the literature also says that it requires double dosing. <clears throat> so I think if you don't have a way to diagnose the condition and you're going to do a diagnostic therapeutic trial, you've really got to give people double dose PPIs. And then the question becomes for how long? So if you look in the GI literature, they talk about three months. If you look in the ENT literature, they talk about up to six months. In the days when these were branded, products. It was a lot of money. It was hard to get for that long, especially double dosing. Now it's easier because, you know, they're, they're generics. But I don't think you need that long to do a diagnostic therapeutic trial because you'll know within a month whether the person is better. So the GI literature says, yeah, it may take three months to really get them completely clear from a symptomatic standpoint. The ENT literature says it may take up to six months to get them clear from a nasopharyngoscopy standpoint, but that's not really clinically what you're interested in. You're interested in is the cough better, is the drainage better, is the lump gone, and that usually improves significantly in a month. And these are not you know, people who are fooled by placebo, because these are people that I see that have had decades of cough. They've been on antihistamines and intranasal steroids and this thing and that thing, and, and they've even been on single dose PPI. They've been on all sorts of stuff and nothing has helped. If you put them on double dose PPI and they come back a month later and they're better, this is not a placebo effect. That's the real disease. There's no, none of the other conditions that can cause the symptoms really do that. But remember, if they don't improve, it doesn't mean that they don't have the condition because of the issue of non-acidic reflux, the uh, pepsin and the tryptase and all those other things. Okay, so what about doing endoscopy? Oh, I'm going to go back. I think I'll we'll, cover that later. Endoscopy. Well, endoscopy is of the esophagus, and if they don't have GERD, they're not going to have esophagitis. So that really has very limited utility. Uh, you, may, you may find GERD, but that still doesn't mean that the symptoms in the oropharynx are from SIRD. War doesn't determine who's right, only who's left. <laughs> All right, so what about pH monitoring? So you can do esophageal pH monitoring, again, either in the distal esophagus, that's the typical place that you do it for GERD. You can get up into the proximal esophagus, which is better, but it's still below the upper esophageal sphincter, okay? So it's upper esophageal, but still below the UES. So that's not gonna help you very much with SIRD. There's dual pH monitoring, that's nice, but still not very good. There's pharyngeal monitoring, which is again above the UES. It's clearly better, but it's not actually in the oropharynx. That's still been shown to be not quite as sensitive and specific as you would like. So really, the gold standard hopefully will become oropharyngeal pH monitoring. So this is the Bravo capsule we poured up before. It's very convenient. You just swallow it, and it measures pH over the 24 hours. But it's measuring, again, esophageal pH, not oropharyngeal pH. So if you look at this diaphragm, right here's, here's your diaphragm. Here's the stomach. Here's the lower esophagus. So a distal esophageal pH monitoring is supposed to be about 5 centimeters from the sphincter. Proximal esophageal monitoring is much higher up, but here's the UES, so it's still below the upper esophageal sphincter. Pharyngeal probes are two centimeters above the UES, which is getting, again, pretty close to where you want it, but again, studies have shown it's not quite as sensitive as getting it somewhere up in the oropharynx. So the device that I use actually puts the probe somewhere up here above the soft palate. So if you're getting acid up there, you've got the disease. So again, even with proximal esophageal pH monitoring, there's considerable variability, because uh, if you found, with a total N of 32, they found that there was esophageal acid in 11 healthy people. So that's, you know, again, not terribly specific. Um, so it had pretty good specificity, but very poor sensitivity and reproducibility. And there was a lot of day-to-day -day variability about the pH in the proximal esophagus. And you can sort of manage that. If, if you've got a more distended stomach, if you had maybe things that lowered the lower esophageal sphincter pressure on one day or another, you may get some acid splashing back up in there, but um, not necessarily up to the oropharynx. 
So I think Orphan GPS monitoring, I think, is state of the art. Um, this the machine, the, the device is actually found by one of our former fellows who might even be listening because he's practicing in Bend, Oregon now, uh, Dr. Adam Williams. I don't know if he's out there. But he actually found the system, and it turned out of all places in the world for it to be, it's in San Diego. Uh, so now it's manufactured by this company called ResTech. Knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. <laughs> So if you can see this, there's a little, very thin, clear plastic tube going into this little bottle. And that bottle is at pH 7, because you have to calibrate each of the, the probes. These are disposable probes. Um, if you look at this, this is the probe at the end of the uvula. And then you pull it back a little bit, and you, it has a blinking red light. And you can see it shining through the soft palate. And then you know it's somewhere back in this area here. So this is a very, very thin, clear plastic tube. The pH monitor itself, at this little bulb on the end right here, I used to say it was this big, uh, but I have some nearsighted patients who couldn't quite see what that was. So now I tell them it's the size of a tear. It's about the size of a tear. It's that small. This is amazing nanotechnology. So you can imagine that how thin the little plastic tube is that you use to insert it in the nose. And um, it, it's so tiny that the brain doesn't really even know it's there, so it's not painful, it's not uncomfortable. Just to make it very easy to slide in the nose, I anesthetize the nose with the lidocaine spray, vasoconstrictor with a phenylephrine spray, but you're not going up with it, you're not going down with it, it's going straight back, so you really hardly even need to do any of that. So this little thin tube comes out of their nose, put a piece of tape over their cheek to hold the probe in the right place, and that's it, everything else is wireless. At the other end of the plastic probe is a little radio transmitter about two inches long. That slips into a little pouch that you wear on the collar. The patient basically has this little de device uh, hardwired attached to their collar. And then there's a recorder that the radio transmitter sends all the data to. The recorder is like a cell phone. It has a belt clip on it. You can wear it that way. It picks up from 10 or 15 feet away so women can hold it in their purse because they're never more than 10 or 15 feet from their purse. At night, it means you can leave it on your nightstand and still walk around the bedroom into the bathroom. So very, very easy, convenient. The patients who've also had esophageal monitoring just think this is just so simple, so easy, they just can't believe what it's like compared to esophageal monitoring. So again, there are standards for what is considered to be significant orpharyngeal acid, but in reality, uh, having done more studies than probably anybody who's ever published before, in normal people, there's no esophageal acid. It's just flat line pH. And the pH in the orpharynx can be anywhere from about 6.5 to 7.5, but it's just basically in that, that range. So when you start to see things dipping, there's really a problem. So here's a typical normal curve. So this is pH actually 7.5 over here, 7.0 over here. And you just see over the entire monitoring period, it's always between 7, 7.5. It just doesn't vary. Now, below it, in panel B, is a patient that has both upright and supine or pharyngeal acid. So the machine also allows the patient, to, it has a clock, has an internal clock, and has buttons on it so the patient can tell me when they're eating, when they're sleeping, if they're having heartburn, if they're having coughing, whatever they're having. So if you can see that on the bottom here is a little red line that comes up like this. This marks when the patient went to sleep, and then here they turned it off because they woke up. So you can see that before they go to sleep, they're having pH down to 4.5, 4.5, even 4.0. Then they go to bed, and it, it falls during the night as well. Here they wake up, and when they're first upright, it, it improves, but then it starts to fall again before they come in to have it removed. So this is basically 24-7 orpharyngeal <coughs> acid. It's going to take a lot to correct this patient, probably surgery. Now here's somebody that only has nocturnal supine reflux, and this is supposed to not happen in this condition. This is somebody who does not have GERD. So when they're upright during the afternoon and evening, nothing's happening. Here's where they go to bed, and the pH just steadily falls, 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 until it reaches an nadir of 4.5. This is about 4 o'clock in the morning. And then see how it goes up here, and then it goes back down again? I always say to the patient, what happened about 5 o'clock in the morning? Did you wake up? Oh, yeah, I woke up. I had to go to the bathroom. Well, sure enough, they assumed the upright position. It just stopped on a dime, went back to bed, and it fell again. And then look what happens here. Here's where they wake up. It just shoots up. It just shoots up. It just stops on a dime. And then it, and when they're upright, there's no problem at all. So this is the patient that has never been described before for surgery. This is a patient without heartburn. And this is what we're seeing. I'll show you the data like 70% of the time. What's so fantastic about this is 
It means that there's some angle between here and here, between horizontal, for the audience who can't see my hand, between horizontal and vertical, that this will stop. And if you can find that angle, that's all the treatment they need. Forget about lifestyle changes, forget about medications. They just need to get the head of their bed up during the night. What is that angle? Nobody knows, because nobody's done this before, but I'll show you the data that we have. So the last panel down here at D is somebody that only has upright reflux, which is what, again, CERN is supposed to be. So during the day over here, you can see the pH is around five, five and a half. Here's where they go to bed, and they go to bed, and the pH jumps up. This, this defies gravity. The pH jumps up. It's perfectly normal the whole time they're asleep. They wake up right here, and it plummets. Really amazing. But th that's the most unusual pattern. And it turns out, again, that's what people say should be happening in CERT. That's the most unusual pattern. So here are the patterns from our study <coughs> with an N of 235. Nobody's done this in health. So um, th these were people, uh, pr prospective people that came into allergy for complaints of you know, typical CERT, postnasal drainage, coughing, uh, that sort of thing. So 52% of them had, were normal. And that's not surprising, this is an allergy clinic, right? It's not an ENT clinic, so a lot of them have allergies, but we want to see what's going on. But that also means that basically 50% of them had the problem. That's astounding that they have the patients that you see are gonna have this problem. It turns out 55% had only supine reflux. This defies everything that's ever been published before, and only 4% had it only when they were upright. So there was a significant group of people that had it obviously both, but these top two numbers are just completely opposite of what's been described before. All right, so then um, what I said to the patients was in the GI literature, if you elevate the head of the bed six inches, it stops. The, uh, the GERD will stop. So let's see what happens if you elevate the head of the bed six inches, what happens in this condition. So it turns out that we had 13 patients who were willing to do this. We have, I have more now, but when we uh, published this, is that when we presented this as an abstract last March at Quad AI, we, we only had 13 patients who had done this. But it turned out that 10 of them had very significant improvement in the follow-up pH monitor, and actually eight out of those 10, it completely resolved with six-inch head of the bed elevation. So that's really then become 62% of all of the subjects. That's pretty impressive when you think about the fact that as medical doctors, we can't cure anything. <laughs> You know, we give medicines to control things. We're not surgeons. We don't rip things out and they're cured. I mean, to think that we could actually, in essence, cure this in 60% of the people by elevating the head of the bed, it's pretty amazing. But how would you know to do that as a cure if you didn't have the pH monitoring because you wouldn't know when the acid is refluxing. So you really have to have the pH monitoring first before you can have the conviction that this is going to be the cure. So here's a couple of graphs, you know, dual graphs. So the, the, the black graph, the bottom graph, is somebody, again, that only had nocturnal reflux. And you could see that during the night, there were two episodes that went down to pH 4. And these were prolonged, hours and hours <coughs> long. But when they elevated the head of the bed, it completely corrected. So that's one. Here's a patient, again, who had, again, as soon as they went to bed, the pH just plummeted. They were at 5 the entire time they were asleep. So we repeated it with the head of the bed elevated, and they stayed right around six and a half, seven, even right through the night. And then here's somebody in whom it didn't help. So again, when they were asleep, the pH was down here in the four and a half range. What they had one really big dip down to three, uh, but the next night when they did it with the head of the bed elevated, they're, they're almost superimposable except for this one extra blip. But that was clearly somebody in whom it didn't help. All right. So I really discussed all of this before. So whenever I fill out an application in the part that it says, in case of emergency, notify, I put in doctor. <laughs> so um, what if somebody has GERD and it's really bad, this I run into this a lot, and you think they have LPR, but they don't want to go off their acid suppression. Remember, I'm measuring acid in the back of the throat, and if they're on PPI as H2 receptor antagonist, I may get a false negative test because they've got acid suppression. So there are ways that you can get around that, um, and that's with esophageal impedance plethysmography. Uh, certain GIs have that. I know there are ones in Seattle who do that. So that's for the patients, again, who have really bad GERD and just won't get off of PPI. I, I only need maybe two, three days at the most off of acid suppression, and you can measure whatever you want to measure. This is kind of an algorithm for treating these patients. You, know, you make the initial assessment, you hear these symptoms. Again, remember the post-nasal drip that they can't really see? 
And then if you want, if you don't have the pH monitor, you can do an empiric trial, but how do you know what to do? Is it medication? Is it lifestyle change? Is it all? Are they going to really comply? So again, I think it's really nice to actually have the data, but you can certainly do an empiric therapeutic trial because if the symptoms improve after, again, I think just a month, just keep that treatment going until hopefully they completely resolve, and then you can start withdrawing. I don't know that everybody necessarily has to have double dose PPI, but um, you, know, you, you want to start that first because you don't know whether it's daytime, nighttime, or both. But then you can start to withdraw treatment if the symptoms completely clear. Um, so that's these two boxes. If the symptoms really don't change much, then you've got to do some diagnostic test. In this study, because it came out of the ENT literature, they said nasopharyngoscopy. I think it's a good idea to get that done once because you want to be sure there's not a vocal cord polyp or a tumor. So I think it's good to do it once for that reason. But again, it's not specific for diagnosing LPR. So I think you've got to go to oropharyngeal pH monitoring. Evening news is where they begin with good evening and then tell you how, why it isn't. <laughs> like last night, boy, last night was bad back east. All right, so let's go over other management of these patients like lifestyle changes. So this is typical GERD stuff where you want to avoid large meals because if you distend the stomach, it's going to put more pressure on the sphincters. You want to avoid spicy or acidic foods. So for a long time, I couldn't quite figure that out because you know what difference does it make if it's really acidic or spicy? But the thing is, if it comes up, that's why it's a problem. It's not that I, I always thought that acidic foods or spicy foods make acid. Where I couldn't quite figure that out. But now that I realize that this is a physical act, reflux is an act. Uh, then if something is spicy or acidic and it refluxes up, it's going to be more irritating. Carbonated beverages are terrible because they distend the stomach uh, with the carbon dioxide gases. And I, I was telling Drew, because I saw his diet Pepsi out early this morning, that um, I, think, I think we're going to find, I, I, I haven't done the study yet, but it's just amazingly uh, impressive to me that so many of the patients that I see with this condition are basically addicted to diet cola drinks. Because uh, I don't see very many people that are just drinking them all day long, but these people are drinking them all day long. And I'll say to them, uh, you want to find out that caffeine, do you drink coffee? No, no, maybe a cup in the morning. What about tea? No, I don't really like iced tea. We go on to smoking, we go on to alcohol, and then I'll say, okay, what about carbonated beverages? Oh yeah, I love Diet Coke. I have them all day long. That is clearly the worst possible thing to drink. So number one, it is acidic. The pH of that is about two. So, not, so if it comes up, it's really irritating. Number two is it's caffeinated, so you get the lowering the lower esophageal sphincter pressure. And then number three is carbonated, so it's distending the stomach. So there really couldn't be a worse thing. And when you think about it going on all day long, it's bad. And then if you add this pepsin issue, remember we're talking about pepsin getting reactivated by acid. So every sip reactivates the pepsin in the back of the throat, making the condition worse. So it's clearly just the worst thing to be drinking. Uh, the other thing is, again, since most of these people have it when they're supine, you want to be sure all the food is out of the stomach before they go to bed. And depending upon the size of the dinner, it could be three hours before you could guarantee that all the food is out of the stomach, so they should delay going to bed for three hours. Weight loss for the same reasons of GERD, you know, nicotine, alcohol, caffeine, uh, elevating out of the bed, we talked about that. It turns out even sleeping position has an effect on this. A really interesting study was done, and it turns out, I hope I change this, yeah, I, I didn't change this. Okay, so you would think that when you were asleep, in the left lateral decubitus position would be the worst because it's putting pressure on your stomach, but it's very counterintuitive, and it's actually the best position. So you want to be sleeping in the left lateral decubitus position to decrease the amount of reflux. Very counterintuitive. Um, then you've got acid, you, know, you have acid suppression, so let's talk about that. Let's see what you want. So acid suppression, you know, again, H2 receptor antagonists, very important to understand this. They decrease basal acid secretion. So we talked about this last night. Um, nobody wonders, you know, I, don't, I don't know why some people wonder things. Everything that you just consume for breakfast is clearly not sterile. And people describe the human mouth you know, as being a sewer. So when you swallow, you're swallowing things that are clearly not sterile. So why aren't our stomachs always becoming infected by this bacteria? When's the last time you saw a patient that had a, a gastritis from bacteria, not a, a viral gastroenteritis? Unless they have achlorhydria, you don't see that because it's the stomach acid that kills that, that bacteria. So 24-7, there's basal acid secretion. And that is a histamine-driven event via the H2 receptor. So H2 receptor antagonists block that. But then when you eat, to digest the food, the stomach turns on those proton pumps, those acid-producing pumps. So that's what PPIs do. They inhibit those pumps. It turns out it's not 
the distension of the stomach that does it. It's actually the neutralization of the, that basal acid secretion by the stomach. So when the stomach's pH goes above four, that's the stimulation for the proton pumps to come on. Okay, so that's why, so for this condition, you really need the PPIs um, because you've got to suppress it all day long. You've got to get those bursts of acid suppressed. So you want to take PPIs before meals, right? Because it's suppressing what the meal does. If you take it along with the meal, then once the pH of the stomach goes up, those pumps are already turned on, so it's too late. So you have to take it before meals. Now what's amazing is, and we talked about this last night, um, it's one of the best ironies that I've heard in medicine, and I, and I really like irony. Um, all of the proton pump inhibitors that are out on the market except one are all totally destroyed by stomach acid. In fact, they're all destroyed by stomach acid. That's an amazing irony. The medicines that suppress the proton pump inhibitors that make acid are all acid sensitive. So all of them except one are enteric coated. So they can pass through the stomach and not be uh, destroyed by the basal acid secretion. But then they have to get into the small intestine and in that alkaline environment, they get absorbed. But then they have to go into the bloodstream, travel back to the stomach and get to the proton pumps before you eat. That takes some time. So you've got to take them a good half hour, even an hour before the meal to make them ideally effective. It turns out that Nexium, not that I have anything against it, Nexium, separate from all of that, just has 20% decreased bioavailability if you take it with food. So if somebody's on Nexium and they take it with food, they're, they're automatically getting 20% of it less absorbed, and then you have all that whole delay thing and terracotta thing. It turns out there's an over-the-counter product used to be prescription that nobody knows about called Zegarid that is not in terracotid, and it's the one that you should think about having patients take if they just can't remember to take their PPIs before meals, because it is what's described as naked omeprazole, or just plain omeprazole prilosec, but mixed with sodium bicarbonate. Brilliant, brilliant concept. So when you swallow it, not in terracotid, the sodium bicarbonate raises the stomach's pH to above four. That turns on the pumps, but guess what? The omeprazole is there to inhibit it. So it's a brilliantly simplistic way of getting around that meal issue but the problem is it's over the counter, only branded, so much more expensive than, than our generic uh, PPI. So what I tell my patients very practically is, when you get up in the morning, you should have your bottle of PPI on the nightstand, and before you do anything else, you take it. So by the time you go pee and go shower and get dressed and get ready to have breakfast, hopefully it's a half hour. So that usually works out pretty well. So it becomes the evening one that's really difficult because nobody knows when they're gonna have dinner. So I tell them to take half of their, their month's prescription with them, have it on their person. And when they're sitting around at work in the late afternoon or early evening and somehow this bolt hits them and says, man, I'm getting hungry. I wonder what I wanna do for dinner. That's when they should take the second PPI because it's gonna be a good half hour, an hour before they actually sit down and eat. So that's what the deal with that. But remember again, you have all this non-stomach, this non-acid, non-stomach acid reflux, including partially digested food and acidic foods. We talked about pepsin and the fact again that it's deactivated in alkaline pH and then reactivated uh, at acidic pH. Believe it or not, it's totally destroyed if the pH is above eight. So one of the things I'm thinking about treating these patients with is alkaline water. Because if they were sipping alkaline water instead of Diet Coke, they would actually be destroying the pepsin instead of reactivating it. And uh, the studies that have been shown that uh, pepsin clearly is cytotoxic to epithelial tissue and releases a, a whole array of really nasty cytokines which can cause the symptoms. So I say, you know, pepsin insert, it's, it's a drinking problem, if you will, because most tap water, most bottled water are around pH seven, you know, plus or minus a little bit. And that would have sort of no effect on pepsin. It's not gonna really activate it because it's not acidic enough, but it's not gonna deactivate it because it's not alkaline enough. But there are some artesian well bottled waters that are above pH eight, and they can actually maybe somehow be an adjunct to treatment for this condition. To steal ideas from one person is plagiarism, but to steal from many is research. <laughs> All right, so what else do we do? So we did, um, how about prokinetic agents? We're down there. So um, first, before we talk about prokinetic agents, let's think about some things that are anti-kinetic agents, if you will, that actually decrease the lower esophageal sphincter pressure. It's not surprisingly anti-cholinergics because the prokinetic ones are cholinergic. But remember, the tricyclic antidepressants, and we use them as antihistamines, right, like doxepin, they have very strong anti-cholinergic side effects. One of the reasons why this is such a common condition in asthmatics may be that beta agonists lower the lower esophageal sphincter pressure 
as do calcium channel blockers, even diazepam and even progesterone. So most people think about prokinetic agents as being metoclopramide, but it turns out there's this concept of N-E-R-T-R, -E which is non-erosive reflux, and, I'm sorry, no, it's T-R-L-E, <coughs> transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, so T-R-L-E. So this is when you swallow, um, it, it, you know, we think that it's to allow the food to be ready to go into the stomach. So when you swallow, there's this sort of reflex that lowers the lower esophageal sphincter pressure to accept the bolus of food. So it's just called, again, transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. And it's thought that this might occur, account for maybe the majority or up to 80% of reflux episodes. This is all in GERD, but it just, I think, is a translation. And it turns out that metoclopramide, even though it's a prokinetic cholinergic agent, actually has no effect on this transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter pressure with swallowing. So therefore, it, as hard a drug as it is to take, because it has so many side effects, as many drug interactions as it has, it may actually not be a very good prokinetic agent for, for reflux. But it turns out that baclofen, which is a gamma amino butyric acid analog, um, antagonizes this transient relaxation of the LES. And there's no data that it actually helps GERD or SERD, but there is data that at least decreases reflux episodes by 43%. Uh, in this other study, they showed that it had a significant effect on these transient relaxations of lower esophageal sphincter. And when it was given to normal volunteers, it also decreased that rate and a study that was done, it was done actually in children, uh, showed that it actually, uh, children, also reduced this transient relaxation, uh, which led to faster gastric emptying. So that may be something that's a much better prokinetic agent, and baclofen has much fewer in a way of drug interactions, all the other issues that you have with metoclopramide. So think about that. Um, again, if you have to think about doing the pH monitoring that we talked about, and then if all of this sort of fails, then you really have to think about surgery. But you know, there's really a, a lot of patients who, for quality of life issues, have said to me, you know, they've had decades of cough, unexplained cough. They've been on all these medications, spending all this money, nothing really worked. They're worried, when you really get down to it, their worry is, do I have tuberculosis? Do I have uh, cancer? Do I have something that's contagious? That's really what worries them. When I tell them what this is all about and what they have to do in terms of lifestyle changes and taking PPIs, which you know are not really perfectly safe. You know, there's all these issues of getting fractures from osteoporosis and getting achlorhydria and getting stomach infections and getting, you know, just think, uh, not, not absorbing calcium, vitamin D, iron very well. And there's just issues around them. So when I finally say, I think you're going to have to have surgery for this, some of the patients just say, you know, now that I know what it is and it's not going to kill me, I'm just going to live with it. I'd rather have my diet cope than take my PPI sort of thing. But at least they know where they're coming from. Now, a bus station is where a bus stops. The train station is where a train stops. On my desk, I have a workstation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so surgical management. So you yeah, really have to think about this when the patient has just symptoms that they don't want to tolerate and they've either attempted or done maximum medical management, which includes all the lifestyle changes. So I mentioned you know, a lot of patients just elect to not do this. Um, a lot of them, though, come to me with literature from the internet that says, but it only helps 50% of the time. You know, why, why am I going to take a chance on that? So I want to talk about that. So um, these days, you, know, you can do laparoscopic fundoplications. Uh, the Nissen is the most common one that's really done for uh, the classic one. And they really take the fundus of the stomach and bring it up above and around the lower esophageal sphincter 360 degrees around. And then they use the stomach muscle as an adjunct to the sphincter to get it to be competent. Um, one of the problems with that is that then it becomes hard to get food down. So nothing's really coming up, which is good, but it's hard to get harder to get food down. So recently, people have been doing something called a toupee fundoplication, where they actually wrap around the three quarters rather than all the way around. And that's good for GERD, because uh, again, you don't need a perfect sphincter, you just need a normally competent sphincter, and then it's easier to swallow things. But for SERD or LPR, it really has to unfortunately be a Nissen. So the surgery isn't really terribly risky, it's laparoscopic. The recovery is what's difficult because now people really have trouble refeeding. Now a lot of these people are obese and, and losing some forced weight loss is not a bad thing, but some of them are pretty skinny and it's, it's an issue. So the refeeding can be an issue. It could take even sometimes a few weeks 
before they're even able to take anything other than a liquid. I've had some patients that actually had to go a couple of months before they're really eating much of anything. So that's why you know, when I tell this to patients, a lot of them just say, okay, I'm, I'm going home and living with this. Now, uh, the, the issue of the success rate depends upon the studies that you read. And a lot of times, especially for LPR, not so much GERD, but for LPR, it's hovering around 50%. But what I explain to my patients is that whether I prescribe your PPIs, your primary care prescribe them, the ENT prescribe them, or the GI prescribe them, if they're going to work, they're going to work. It doesn't matter who prescribed them. But if you're going to have surgery, it really depends upon who does the procedure. And any place that's going to be able to publish an experience with these procedures is going to have to be an academic medical center. And as much as I love them and I'm speaking at one in the surgery department, who does the surgery? It's going to be the surgical residents. And this is, this is a tough thing to do for LPR because you've got to do a Nissen and you've got to do the Nissen well because you want to make that, yeah, here's what I may have left out, you want to make that valve, I think, totally competent. If you leave it normally competent, then you're still going to have SIRD, right? We talked about that. People with SIRD have a competent lower esophageal sphincter. It's an incompetent upper esophageal sphincter. So I want my surgeons to make that a perfectly competent valve so nothing is getting out, no stomach contents and no um, uh, acid. So whether or not the surgical residents understand that, whether or not even the surgical attending understands that. So I think the, the surgical response rate could be 50-50. But when I refer a patient to the laparoscopic surgeon that I want them to go to, it's not 50-50. It's like 90% of the time. Is there any surgery for the upper esophageal sphincter? No, there's not because, you know, it's funny. It's not even really a sphincter. It's just kind of a geographical area. So I was hoping one of these days, because if you look at this slide, there are now endoscopic surgical procedures for GERD, not even laparoscopic, but endoscopic. And they work pretty darn well for mild GERD. And I think these days, again, when people are reticent to be doing acid suppression for a lot of different reasons, it kind of makes sense to go in and do a little endoscopic procedure. That's just never going to work for SIRD. But I was hoping that maybe endoscopically they could do something to the UES. And then I started reading more about the UES, and it's not that well-defined a sphincter sitting in the... So I, I, don't, I don't know about that, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, pretty much done some time for questions. So remember, you see a patient and you see them all day long, you come in complaining about a cough. And here's the thing, maybe for the fellows particularly, when I see a patient who complains of cough, my first question is, why do you cough? Where is it coming from? Because they, you know, they referred from pulmonary, they were referred to a pulmonologist because they cough and they point to their throat. And they say, well, I said, why do you cough? Well, my throat tickles, right? I feel drainage back there. You know, why do you go to pulmonology? This can't be anything in your lungs, it's here. So I ask them where the cough is coming from, I ask them to describe what they feel that makes them want to cough. And again, if they get into this drip thing or something stuck in the back of the throat, ask them, well, what does it look like? And if they don't know, your level of suspicion is way up there. If they have hoarseness, even if it's just intermittent, when maybe a week or so they're hoarse, then it gets better, that's really suggestive. And again, the big thing is that they don't have to have GERD to have SIRD. So, my last few paraprodoxians. The last thing I want to do is to hurt you, but it's still on my list. <laughs> if I agree with you, we both be wrong. And I didn't say it was your fault, I said I was blaming you. <laughs> Thank you. You go for it. You've got weeks to, to deal with these symptoms when you use the acid suppression. What happens when you use the bed elevation? How long do you, does it yeah, take so to see that's the part of that, that you know, we're doing that study now is to see whether they get better. So what we have now is just the data that we're able to physically correct the reflux in 70, 60% of the patients. So now we're collecting data on if it's actually changing the disease, which it theoretically should, and then B in terms of what time. So I'm, I, the little bit of data that we have is it's in the same time frame because, you know, what I tell the patients is you start on PPIs, there's nothing that that treatment is doing to heal the irritation that's already there, right? All you're doing is you're preventing more acid from coming up to do more damage. So that damage has to heal on its own. And as if any of you know, as we get older, you know, I, I had a little cut that if I was a kid would be gone in two days. And now, three weeks later, four weeks later, I'm still looking at that cut healing. So the healing process slows down as you get older. And there's nothing about the medical treatment that really does heal. You're just preventing further damage. So, there's, um, so that's why it's at least a month you know, for the medicines, and I think it's going to be a month for the other treatment as well, because it just takes time for the tissue to heal. Does upper airway inflammation make this worse? Like, if, have you studied that? 
study this in allergic patients, like put grass up their nose and see if that exacerbates them. You know, we've not, because some, some of these patients will say that when they're speaking, that's when their cough goes crazy. I think it's because like I'm speaking now, and you have to suck air through your mouth, and you drive it back in your throat out. So all the same sort of nonspecific irritant symptoms that we know bother our allergic rhinitis patients, you know, dust and smoke and smog and the speaking, all tend to irritate these people. But obviously, if they have some other reason for post-nasal drainage, you know, sinusitis or allergic rhinitis, that's also going to make them cough. So undoubtedly, it's, it's going to be worse. You know, previous studies have failed to show that uh, proton pump inhibitors help LPR. Are you going to do a double-blind placebo-controlled trial to show that it does? We wouldn't have enough patients to really do it. You know, the, the studies, in general, you know, do show that it helps, but it's it's clearly not ideal, and there are some studies that say that it doesn't help. Um, some of them, you know, were done single dose, and I think it has to be double dose, and some were dosed at night. It's not at night; it was before bed. So I think the studies that are more recent that have done double dosing before meals generally show that it is helpful, but it doesn't surprise me that it's, even if a study showed it wasn't, because again, all that's dealing with is stomach acid, and this is such a much more complicated disease. Maybe but, you have but to I don't think separate so. out the two and just take the stomach acid one instead. Yeah. And do a double blind on the head and that approach. Yeah, the ones that have upright reflux, absolutely. Sure. Was, then the head of the bed is not going to be the curative thing. So. I have two more questions. I still am having trouble with this acid thing, but do you have any Bravo probes with your LPR simultaneously so you can see? You said it's normal acid from the esophagus lower. Yeah. Can you show that that correlates, that normal acid in the esophagus correlates with your LPR? So, so I've never done it, I've never done it like simultaneously, but I have in an array of patients who don't have GERD, which is an autoimmune disease, I have either directly through GI or because ENT thought they could send them to GI and they would figure out that they had acid reflux and then treat it. So these people have been to GI with negative endoscopies and negative 24-hour pH monitors who then I do on a different day and show that they have this. So I have lots of that data, but not literally consecutively in the same person. I hadn't really thought about that. Okay, and then the second question is, can you measure with your little probe? Can you sample for trypsin and pepsin? No, because this is a just a little pH monitor, you know, commercial pH monitor. What we are going to do um, is to start to do some scrapings and even some, like the same thing with a nasal scraping. I want to start scraping the back of these people's throats and just look for cells and see what the cells are, but also look for you know, cytokine signals, but also you know, try to do assays for pepsin and trypsin and all that sort of stuff. No one's really done that, but I think that that's really just ripe to be done. I think nobody's really done it because their GIs are not interested in the area. And, and, but anyway, so we're really getting geared up to start doing that on consecutive patients. It's going to be very interesting. I, we talked about this last night. I wouldn't be surprised if we actually find some eosinophils back there, although by the same token, steroids don't help this condition. Because it, it just amazes me that, just like we were talking about how the criteria for GERD is not acid or not acid, the criteria for eosinophilic esophagitis is not eosinophils or no eosinophils, it's above a certain level. So clearly, GERD is associated with lower esophageal eosinophilia. What is it about stomach acid that triggers eosinophils into the area? So what in the world could be happening in the back of the throat, too? So I wonder whether you can see eosinophils there. But just like you know, steroids don't help GERD, steroids don't really help this condition either. And when people stop their proton pump inhibitors, a lot of them have a pretty dramatic rebound and they get way more acid. Does that show up as more LPR? Well, I mean, so I don't think that it should show up as, I don't think it should show up as more LPR. Again, if it did, then we would be seeing, we would never see a normal. Again, we, you know, we, half of the patients that we saw were, were although they weren't on PPIs. So I don't know what number we have that I, so I don't go, actually, it's Greek. I love, so I love giving the talks because everybody always comes up with a, a wrinkle they hadn't thought about. So we, I have to go back and look at the data about people who we took off of PPIs and see how many of them had negative pharyngeal probes. Uh, because that's, that would answer your question. It's a great, it really answer you a great question. So, so there is, I know, the, um, just like people were, when the PPIs originally came out, the FDA said you should only take them for a couple of months because they were afraid of the fact that gastrin which is the stimulus to get the acid, the brain sends signals to the stomach to make more gastrin because no acid is coming down the pipe. So um, gastrin levels in rodents go way up after PPIs, and in fact, they just keep going up. They never level off. And some of the rodents developed uh, tumors of the gastrin-producing cells in the stomach. So when the FDA saw that, when PPIs were first released, they were, people were told to only take them for two or three months and then give the stomach a rest. 
But then what happened was uh, humans are smarter than some rodents, and the human brain, after a while, realizes there's no point in putting out this big gastrin signal, so it levels that signal off. So there's never been a reported case of a tumor in, in humans, even though people take them all the time. But there still is elevated gastrin levels. It's just not forever going up. So when you withdraw PPIs and now have unopposed gastrin, you're going to get a rebound in acid. So that's why I warn the patients with GERD that if they stop their PPIs, they could get worse. And some of them just say, I don't want to go there. So they get the plethysmography studies. But that's going to be great data to mine. Thanks for that. Sure. <laughs> you know, there's uh, one other side effect of having the fundoplication is that people cannot vomit after. Yes, yeah, so you make the sphincter totally confident. And there's a surgeon here at, at, at Swedish Hospital who does that very well. Mm -hmm. But it, you can't vomit. Yeah, I mean, you sort of, it, it's a, I've had patients describe it to me. I mean, they, they, yeah. Yeah, it's a weird, weird feeling. Um, yeah. But, you know, on balance, how many times in your life have you really had emesis versus having, again, daily, daily grind? No, I mean, it's, it's yeah. clearly a worthwhile trade off. There's some data that at 10 years, the proton pump inhibitor therapy for reflux is the same as surgery, which was pretty discouraging to me when I'm trying to recommend something to a patient. But is you think that that's what we're going to find with this too? Is it's a lifetime issue and unless they have major yeah, changes? Because, when you think about it, you know, you'd say, I'm, I'm sure you might make the same argument about you know cholesterol medicines and high blood pressure medicines and all of that, that people just fall off the wagon. They, they Stop. The lifestyle changes are really hugely important because this, this is not just an acid you know, disease. And if they start straying from the lifestyle changes, then it doesn't matter that they're still on their PPI. So I think you're right, it, it's going to happen. Uh, and that's why surgery just seems to be the, the great equalizer because once you get that totally competent sphincter, unless for some reason that loosens after time, and so far I don't see data that that's the case, that is truly a fix and a cure done right. So, you know, again, I, I try to move patients towards that uh, if they're really having a lot of trouble. But then they're done. You know, then they, they can do what they want to do with their lives. <laughs>